So first, we're going to go to Matthew 7. Verse 7. And for your title today, Charity, this one's for you. Your title is Look Harder. So if you're taking notes, and you absolutely should be, if you are not, go ahead and get either a sheet of paper out, notebook, journal, cell phone, PDA, stone tablet, whatever it is that you use, go ahead and pull it out. Title today is Look Harder. I'm going to read Matthew 7, 7 through 8 to you, in the amp, amplified. Ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who keeps on asking receives, and he who keeps on seeking finds, and to him who keeps on knocking it will be opened. Or, what man is there among you? who, if his son asks for bread, will instead give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will instead give him a snake? If you, then evil, sinful by nature, as you are, know how to give good and advantageous gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, perfect as he is, give what is good and advantageous to those who keep on asking them? I went a little bit farther there, but I think that's really good to read, considering what I'm about to explain to y'all. So, the title of this, as I said, is Look Harder. And the reason why this came up is because I was thinking, I guess I have finally reached a certain age where I will tell my students to go find something and they will look for it and they'll come back and tell me that they can't find it. And I say, okay, go look again. And then they come back and they're like, I can't see it. And I'm like, all right, if I go over there and I find it, what's gonna happen? They're like, wait, hold on, let me go find it. <laughs> So I was thinking about that because as, as a child, this, and I'm sure a lot of y'all can relate to this, this is a situation that I was in many times. My dearest mother, my wonderful mother, who's right there, I love you so much, she would tell me, okay, go in the kitchen, go find this. And I'm like, okay, and then I'll go in the kitchen. And then in my mind, I am looking up and down and all around, and I'm really just looking through everything, and I come back and I'm like, I can't find it. She's like, no, just go, go look again, go look in the drawer, and I'm like, okay. And I go in. I can't find it. <laughs> She's like, now if I come in there and I find that thing, you in trouble. I'm like, okay, oh dear Lord. I'm like, well, you're not gonna find it because I've already looked. And then she goes in there. Is this it? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, is this is this witchcraft? What's happening? <laughs> so it's just the difference between a child and an adult. When you're a child, you don't necessarily look as hard as an adult would for certain things, or you may not even know necessarily what to look for. So, the, in the topic and the theme that we're going over today, it's areas in which we need to look harder and grow up in Christ so that we no longer have a childlike perspective, but we have an adult perspective whenever we're looking for things. So, just three things that I'm gonna go over with y'all today. Three areas in which we need to look harder. One, is events, so we need to look harder where events are concerned. Two, situations, we need to look harder where situations are concerned. And lastly, three, is people. We need to look harder where people are concerned. So first we're going to talk about events. And I'd like you all to turn, please, to Exodus 32. Verses 1 through 5. And the main question we always need to ask ourselves with all three of these things is, is this really what it looks like? Is what we're seeing really what it looks like? 
And so Exodus 32, verses 1 through 5, I'm going to read this to you, and then I'm going to explain it in a way that may be able to more easily understand in, in nowadays terms. Because we look at this now, and this is the story of the golden calf. And this is when Moses went up on, onto the mount, and the people were getting restless, and so they decided that they were going to uh, go ahead and make themselves a god. So in Exodus 32, verse 1, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, they gathered together before Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a god who will go before us. As for this Moses dude, the man who brought us out of Egypt, I don't know what the heck has happened to him, so uh, can you go ahead and make something for us? Because we can't see nothing. So Aaron's like, okay, whatever. Take off all your gold. Uh, take all everything that you've got and just, just bring it to me. So all the people took off the gold rings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took the gold from their hands and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, and he said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. <laughs> now, when Aaron saw the molten calf, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Okay, now we can obviously see what's wrong with this picture. It's, what'd you say? Everything. <laughs> okay, let's get a little more specific. What's wrong here? What have they done that's incorrect? They built an idol. They said the idol. Say that they just. <laughs> now that's that. Ashley just brought up a very very important point. She said the idol saved them, but they just made it. <laughs> but here's the thing, though, and this is where we need to kind of pause a little bit. The idol saved them, but they just made it. This idol was representative of something for them. Who was the idol? They were trying to make an idol for Yahweh. So it wasn't they were just making it, because he literally says, uh, he got up in the morning, whatever, blah, 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 blah. Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And you see the Lord is capitalized. So, you know, they may have thought, this is a good thing. You know, we don't have a statue for Yahweh God. So we're going to make one. Because that's what they did back in Egypt. Because this calf... Do you know who this calf was? It's an Egyptian god, Apis. It was an Egyptian god, Apis, a bull god from Egypt. And that's what a lot of the Egyptian culture did. So what they did is they tried to mix the culture of Egypt in with the worship of Yahweh God. And so on the outside, they're like, well, we're just worshiping God. And he's like, no, melt that thing down and drink it. That's literally what happened. Yeah, they had to melt it down and drink it. Because that is not what pleases God. You can't give the culture of the world to God and say, you know what, Lord, this is for you. <laughs> He's like, I didn't make that. <laughs> what is this? And so we can't worship God with disobedience to God. That's not how it works. And so we've got people nowadays who are saying, I love God worship God, and their lives are completely in contradiction to what God has said. And so we need to look a little deeper on the surface, because there are people who will argue with you to the death that God knows their heart, and so it's okay for them to be a lying, cheating, stealing thief. <laughs> and that's not how it works. You cannot worship God with disobedience to God. So everything that happens, you need to look deeper. The event was not what it looked like. It may have seemed a good thing to be worshiping God, but if you look harder than just the surface level, they were mixing pagan worship of Apis with the worship of the one true God. They tried to mix the popular culture of their day with the worship of God. So when the culture around us begins to take part in something, we need to look harder before we just jump on board, because if we don't look harder, we're going to be deceived. And I brought this up last year <clears throat> at the beginning of the lockdowns. So we all know about the fever dream that was 2020 and everything that happened there. But whenever the lockdowns first started, there's something I mentioned. Whenever all the churches decided that they were going to be shutting down, not all of them, obviously. We were in, we were in business. But anyway, when all of the other churches began shutting down, one thing I mentioned was 
What happened to all those people that said, we'll never shut down the church? The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. You know, everyone's made all these, all these declarations, and, you know, they'll quote, you know, Hebrews 10.25 that says, we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of the saints. But then all of a sudden, this lockdown happens, and all the churches go belly up. And the crazy thing to me is that a lot of them are still not open. A large number of churches are still not open. And it's been a year, a year of not assembling together. And so I thought that was really interesting because I read an article. And in this article, it was at the beginning of the pandemic again. And this person was saying, you need to stop you know, rebuking churches that closed because they're doing the right thing. And I was like, what in the world? So I'm reading this, and he's like, yeah, it's the right thing. We need to do what's right for the, the world and for the safety and for the health and for everybody. And this dude is just, just going on about how if you close your churches, you're doing the right thing, you're doing the God thing, that's what Jesus would do. And I looked at that same article yesterday, I think. That man printed a retraction. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read it to you. So he said, we accepted the premise that places like fast food restaurants and liquor stores and cannabis dispensaries and legalized states were essential and their workers needed to take risks to be together, while corporate worship was unessential. And we didn't need to be together. I did not think through the implication of accepting a framework in which McDonald's workers needed to risk themselves to provide everyone with Big Macs and fries, but Christians didn't have any duty pressing enough for us to need to be together. So we have to, and he finally was able to look past it, but he even said in the article, I realize this too late, because people are comfortable now with waking up, putting no clothes on, and just turning the service on. They're no longer attending service. They're no longer assembling. They're watching service. They're spectating. And at the beginning of it all, I said, we have to be careful because this whole lockdown thing, it's not what it looks like. If it was a deception, that means it's not obvious because it's supposed to deceive. You have to look much deeper than the surface level. And so many people didn't look deeper than the surface level, and that's why their churches are still closed to this day. So anytime we see that all the world and all the culture around us is doing something, we need to stop, and we need to think, what is really happening? What is going on beneath the surface level? If we're to avoid being deceived, we must look harder than just the surface level. And the second thing, Situations, and once again, the question is, is this what it looks like? And this has to do with what is our reaction when unfavorable situations occur. We're going to go to James 1. Some of y'all may already know where I'm going. We're going to look at James 1, verses 2 through 4. It says, Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. Let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfectly and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. And again, we're still talking about the difference between a childlike perspective and an adult perspective. When you're not mature, when you don't have an adult perspective, you view the processes meant to teach you as torture. And, you know, no, no more have I experienced this phenomenon than in the years that I've spent as a middle school teacher. 
So I teach seventh graders this year, yeah, seventh graders and ninth graders. And the, I, I had just convinced myself that I would never teach seventh grade ever because something happens over the course of the summer between seventh and eighth grade that makes them sort of tolerable to teach. But this year I've got two seventh grade classes. I love them and it, it's all worked out. But in these seventh grade classes, it's a little different. So we're working on essays because they have this test at the end of the year, this wonderful, beautiful test that's known as the star exams. So they have to write an essay. Okay, so they have to write an, an essay for their star writing exam. So we do frequent practice, like very frequent practice. We're practicing all the time because these are things that they're not used to doing, ways that they're not used to writing, things they're not used to looking for and looking at. So I, I give them drills, I sit down with them, you know, just one-on-one -on -one helping them. I walk around making sure that everybody's got it. And, you know, normally it's fine. Uh, a lot of the kids actually really do appreciate it. There's one time, <clears throat> Buddhist child. So there's one time I get up and I'm like, all right, so now that we've done our warm-up, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get started on working on your body paragraphs today. This kid says, ugh! Why are you torturing us? And I said, excuse me, sir. And I had to like pause for just a second because I'm like, remember, these are seventh graders. <laughs> these are 12 year olds. Cause, and the, the other kids were looking at him, but they, they looked at me because they thought I was about to <laughs> lose my mind. And I just took a second. Excuse me, sir. Um, so there is a difference between torture and teaching. When you're being tortured, you're put in a bad situation with no way to get out of it. When you're being taught, you may be put in that same bad situation, but you're given the tools to get out of it. So what I'm doing with you is not torture. I'm teaching you because I'm sitting down with you every single day. I'm teaching you all the strategies that you need and I'm trying to make sure that you pass this test. So do not confuse what I'm doing with torture. <clears throat> and I like to imagine maybe God does that every now and again with us. He's like, do not confuse what I'm doing with torture. <laughs> but yeah, in teaching, when you're being taught, you're not only given the challenge, but you're given the tools and the strategies to overcome that challenge. But if you only view it as torture, you will never learn anything from it. So we are only able to learn from the teaching once we realize that we have been given the tools to succeed. If our trials aren't producing patience in us, we're not being taught, we're being tortured. And who's doing the torturing? We are. Because like imagine you're locked up in a dungeon, right? You're in a dungeon and there's a key over there on the wall. Let's just imagine it's right there. It's, it's, it's right there on the wall. And while you're in the dungeon, you run up to the door, you start beating, let me out, let me out, I'm being tortured, let me out, please. <laughs> My question is, who is torturing you when the key to get out is on the wall? So when we don't allow God to work through the situations that we're in, all we're doing is really just torturing ourselves. And let's go to Romans 8, 28. Please. See, we've been given the tools in order to overcome a situation. Maybe requires a little bit of work to utilize them, but we have been given the tools. And a lot of times when we're in these situations, we're beating on the door, begging for God to let us out of them. When God is trying to work something in us through them. And in Romans 8, 28, says, and we know with great confidence that God who is deeply concerned about us causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God 
and for those who are called according to his plan and purpose. So this doesn't mean that God is causing everything in your life to shatter and crumble. Hmm? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes we do that ourselves. But yeah, this doesn't mean that everything is caused by him attempting to punish us. But if we end up in those situations, he is able to use them if we allow him to. And there is a Bible plan that we're doing on Wednesday nights, the ones that uh, my girls and my husband love so dearly. And that is, what plan is that? Dangerous prayers, exactly. We've been on this one for quite some time. We've done it a few times, and I think I mentioned it last year when we did it as well. But there was a message that we listened to, and we've been on it for quite some time. It was called the Break Me message. And so it's being broken out of ourselves so that we can be used by God. And the example that he used was the woman that had the alabaster jar of perfume, and that she broke it, she poured it out on Jesus. And that was literally, you know, all that she had. Because her job, her profession, I guess, you, I don't know if you want to call it a profession. Let's not call it a profession. She's a prostitute. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> making money, yeah. So that was, that alabaster jar of perfume was her calling card to all of the eligible and ineligible men in the city to, uh, you know, come be hither and they would, you know, do what they do anyway. So this was her livelihood. This alabaster jar of perfume, really ridiculously expensive alabaster jar of perfume, she broke it and then poured it out. And then obviously, you know, everyone was, was freaking out, but this is all of her, everything that she had, she broke it and poured it at the feet of Jesus. And one thing that was in this message, a quote that was in this message was, God never wastes a hurt. Which is true. Anytime that we have situations, God doesn't waste those. They're not wasted. However, on our Wednesday meeting last week, my dearest husband, Ben, said something very poignant. God never wastes a hurt but he can't do anything with it until we pour it out to him. So if you view your hurt as just pain, that's all it will ever be, is just pain. It's not until you give it over to God that he's able to actually do something with it. So we need to change our perspective, look beneath the surface level. It's not just pain. This is something that God can use to work something out in your life. Amen, amen, and amen. <laughs> and number three, people. Hey. <laughs> well, God bless him. All right, number three is people. We need to ask ourselves again, is this what it looks like? <clears throat> and for this, we're going to John eight forty four. God bless you too. So the context of this scripture here is Jesus is preaching to the Jews. He's talking to them. And they are ones that many of them believed on him. And so he's saying, yeah, if you abide with me, then... You will truly be my disciples. You'll be set free. And in the midst of this, there are a couple of people uh, that get a little bit of, maybe prideful is the word. So they're priding themselves on the fact that genetically they are Abraham's children. But Jesus says, uh, no, you are of your father, the devil. <laughs> 
and it's your will to practice the desires which are characteristic of your daddy, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks what's natural to him because he is a dirty liar and he's the father of lies and half-truths. So Jesus didn't just see the surface level. Oh yeah, oh, yeah these, are, these are Abraham's descendants, therefore they are the ones who shall forever inherit. No, he, looks, he looked much deeper than the surface level. He's like, no, y'all some snakes. That's what y'all are. He's like, no, I, I look a little deeper than that. And that's what we're all suppo also supposed to do. We need to look past what's on the surface level and stop just seeing people that get on our nerves and look at the spirit behind them. Because when we stop looking at people themselves and start looking at the spirit behind them, we transfer our frustration with the people to opposition against Satan. So if our emotions with people are simply frustration, these emotions are fruitless. It isn't the people that we're contending against. It's the spirit that's operating through them. All right, I'll say one more time. It isn't the people that we are contending against. It is the spirit that is operating through them. And what we see on the surface is not always what's going on on the inside. And then I can use this. I have plenty of situations that I could utilize from the classroom. But there's one in particular that comes to mind. There's a student I had last year in eighth grade. And now that I teach ninth grade, I have him again this year. But this student would not necessarily act out in class, but he would just say things that were wildly inappropriate. Uh, like we were going over uh, the diary of Anne Frank, and this kid was just saying things like, yeah, Hitler was right all along. We should have just gotten rid of everybody. Like he would just say things like this in order to get attention. Bless you. In order to get attention. And he would do this often. And the thing that would really get him into trouble is the fact that he wouldn't do his work. And so there were times where the comments would go over the line and we'd have to you know, do something about that. But there was one time that I'm like, you know, just, just go outside real quick. I'll talk to you in a second. And instead of doing you know, standard procedure, we just send the kid to the office or we just write him up and then they go to ISS for a few days. I'm like, let me go talk to this kid and see what's going on. And so I sit here and I have a conversation with this kid and he tells me everything that's going on. He doesn't live with his parents, he lives with his grandparents and there's a lot of other things that are going on there and he had a very, very negative self view. And I told y'all before that I have my one a year at least, which means that I have at least one child every year that comes and tells me that they want to end their lives. And it was this year that I had him that he told me that he wants to just tie a noose and end it all. And so, like, okay, let's, let's sit down and talk about this. And so we, we spent a lot of time talking we ended up bonding over, you know, anime and, and manga and other things like that that we, <laughs> yeah, that we uh, would talk about. And it took a while, but this is a child that even the counselor said, this child is wearing me out. And it took a lot of time, a lot of conversation, and a lot of just time with him to really get out the reasons why he was feeling this way, why he was acting out, and why he was saying those things. So if I had done what a lot of teachers do, which is you're acting out, go to the office, go to ISS, and then that's the end of it. That's surface level. And it's not getting into the heart of what's truly wrong with a person. And so there are times that we interact with people and we see the surface level results. And many times we try to kill a lemon tree by cutting off the lemons. And that's not how it works. You have to go down to the root. Because if you just keep, oh, well, this is a problem. Well, this is a problem. Well, this is a problem. You're going to keep having that problem. 
you have to get down to the root with people. And so whenever we're in situations with people that don't act the way that we want them to, we have to remember it's not just surface level things that we're dealing with. There's spirits a lot of times that are underlying that we have to address. And then there are also emotional hurts that we have to address as well. And even if you're not in the position to emotionally help that person, you are always in the position to pray for that person. And y'all know, some of y'all know the name of this child that I'm talking about, but I have asked for so much prayer for this child. And he has come back and he's been making friends, he's been doing better, he's been getting all high grades, and I'm like, you know what? Look at God. But it's one of those things where we can't just give up because we feel like these people are hopeless and woe is me and the world is ending and nobody knows the trouble I've seen. We can't get all up in arms about that. We have to address it because when we just complain, that does nothing. It does nothing. It requires prayer. It requires action. If we just beat on this dungeon door, we're not going to get out of the dungeon. We have to actually put in the work and do something. And this... Looking beneath the surface doesn't just pl apply to others. It applies to us as well. I'm almost finished here. But there is a wonderful anointed movie that I really like, and it's called The Lion King. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great story. I mean, I know it because it, it's because it, it draws from the Bible. A lot of its plot is really drawn from the Bible. They'd be just yanking stuff out of there and pretend like they made it up. But in the movie, but specifically when I went to go see the show, like the live show when my sister was in it, when I would go and see that, there was a specific scene that would always really impact me. And it's in the movie, but in, in the show they added a song. In the movie, it's when Rafiki and adult Simba meet and Simba's like, well, I'm not, I ain't doing nothing. Like, I'm good just chilling in this forest with this warthog and this meerkat and eating some bugs. I'm good. I got the vegetarian lifestyle down. Like, this was not, his, his intention was to just do nothing, sit back and do nothing. And Rafiki's just like, is this what your father would have done? You know? And he's like, uh, no, my father's dead. And he's like, mm, okay, well, look at, now, look at, look at your reflection. And so he looks at the reflection. He's just like, what? It's just me. And Rafiki tells him, look harder. And then he looks, and in his reflection, he saw the one who lived in him, his father. And, you know, there's a song that they have in the, in the Broadway musical, and there is some... Some of those lyrics, sometimes when I listen to that song, I actually cry. Like, it's very, very impactful. Some of the lyrics on there, it says, Wait, there is no mountain too great. Hear the words and have faith. Mamela, which means listen. He lives in you. And, I mean, I know it's a Disney movie and it's a Disney show, but whatever. But there's a lot to be drawn from that because once he looked harder and he saw the father that lived inside of him, the father didn't say he was going to do it for him. He said, remember who you are. And it wasn't until he recognized that he was a reflection of his father. It wasn't until he remembered who he was that he went back and got Pride Rock out of the alleyways of Detroit because it was looking jacked up. It wasn't until then that he actually took action. It wasn't until he listened to the words of his father, remembered who he was, and then he took his place. And so we have to change the way that we look. We can't look just surface level. Because when Jesus came to live on the inside of you, you're not just you on the surface level. If you look deeper, if you look deeper in you, if you look deeper, you find the spirit of the living God. 
Y'all ain't like, hear that. When you look deeper, you find the spirit of the living God on the inside of you saying, hey, remember who you are. Get your world out of Detroit. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to keep hating on Detroit. But if you look deeper, you will see that God is saying, I'm not here to do all this for you. I've given you the equipment to do this on your own. Not just on your own, but with the things that I have given you. And so we have to stop just looking at everything surface level. We can't just look at ourselves surface level and think, oh, how am I going to do this? We need to Philippians 4.13 a little more often. I know people be looking at that as one of those John 3.16, oh, these are all just cliches. These aren't cliches. It's the word of God. And there's power in every single piece of this word right here. We need the Philippians 4.13 a lot more often than we do because the spirit of the living God, the God who created the universe, the God who created the very world that we stand on, because you might think, like, imagine if this earth, you know, we have all the grass, all of the earth, all of the soil, and then someone comes and they pave over it with concrete. Does the ground underneath no longer exist? No. It's still there. Even though it may have been covered up or attempted to be covered up, it's still there. And you know what ends up happening over time? If that you know, road isn't maintained, the earth starts coming back up. So even though Satan may come and try to pave over everything and make it look like he's in control of everything, God is still there. Even if you don't see him, God is still what's holding this earth up, what's holding you and I up, what's holding this universe together. And if he's the one who's holding the universe together and he lives on the inside of you, what is it there that you need to be afraid of? What is there that you cannot overcome when the spirit of the living God lives on the inside of you? Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God, for your spirit on the inside of us, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you have given us the ability to overcome every situation. Let's just go to, John, to Philippians 4.13 right now. Jesus. 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 We know Philippians 4.13 means I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But I, I'm going to read it in the Amplified. <laughs> surprise, surprise. I can do all things which he has called me to do through him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill his purpose. I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for everything and equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength and confident peace. Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We need to spend much more time, so much more time, looking deeper than the surface level. Because when we get stuck on the surface level, that's where we operate. And we have no more power than what it is that we can muster up on our own. But when we start looking deeper and recognize what's truly on the inside of us, that's when God is able to move. That's when God is able to teach us. That's when he's able to lead us. That's when he's able to guide us. That's when he's able to teach us and instruct us and then work through us in the lives of others. Oof. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for you on the inside of us, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, that you are operating through us, God. Thank you, Father, that in every situation, we are not less than anything. 
We are equal to and greater with the greater one that is on the inside of us than any situation that we may come up against. And we thank you, Father, for that. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for helping us to remain cognizant of that fact, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, that we are reminding ourselves of that on a daily basis so that we don't lose sight of the power that you have placed on the inside of us, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, that we're no longer ineffective Christians in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, that we are taking those tools that you have given us, and we're going out into this world, and we're taking it for you. We're occupying until you come in Jesus' name. We are occupying and not just laying down and hoping that we don't die. Thank you, Father, that we are being more than just Christians who will stand there and say that we have a label, and that's it. I thank you, Father, that you are pushing us out into this world so that we can be who it is that you want us to be in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, for it. And we thank you, Lord, that you are instructing us every single day through everything that we go through, Lord God. You are instructing us to be more and more like you, that we're no longer looking with childish eyes in Jesus' name, but we are mature. We are mature believers in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, for it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being with us, working in and through us, in Jesus' name, amen, Jesus.